Hi, I'm Professor Baldwin, and today I'm going to teach you about exponential functions. An exponential function is a function of the form f of x equals b to the power of x. b has to be greater than 0, so it has to be positive, and it cannot equal 1. Three examples of exponential functions are 3 to the power x, 1 third to the power x, and the square root of 2 to the power x. These next three are not exponential functions. x squared, the base is a variable. It's not a real number. n of x, here the base is negative 1 third. It's negative. Remember, the base, b, has to be greater than 0. And the last example, 1 to the power of x, well, the base is 1. That's another restriction of an exponential function. The base cannot equal 1. Next, you have some properties of the graphs of an exponential function. If your base is greater than 1, that function is increasing, and we call it an exponential growth function. If your base is a fraction, so it's between 0 and 1, it's a decreasing function, and we call those exponential decay functions. The domain for an exponential function is all real numbers, and the range is the set of all positive real numbers. The line y equals 0, or your x-axis, is going to be your horizontal asymptote, and your function will pass through the point 0, 1, because any base to the power of 0 is equal to 1. Let's look at our first example. Here we're going to graph the function and then write the domain and range in interval notation. Our function here is a base 3 to the power of x. Well, we know that we're going to have a horizontal asymptote right here. So this is our asymptote of y equals 0. Then we know that our function is going to pass through the point 0, 1. Let's find one more point. If we substitute in x equals 1, f of x equals 3 to the power of 1, or 3. That gives us another point. We could also substitute in x equals 2 and f of 2 would give us the value of 9. That's off of our graph, but I guess we can put it there anyway. So connect these dots. Remember that that horizontal asymptote is where our graph is going to approach. And I'm going to label this as f of x. Because our next example, we're going to use some transformations on this graph. Now we need to know the domain. Our domain would be what x values can we use in this function? And you can have any x value. So it's all real numbers, negative infinity through positive infinity. And then our range here is going to be the lowest y value you can input, which is 0. Remember, it's not including 0. That's our asymptote, and we never touch it here. And our graph is going upwards. It's increasing, so our range is going to approach infinity. Now, in example two, we're going to use transformations of the graph we just drew, 3 to the power of x, to help us graph the next function, p of x. And then we need to determine its domain and range, as well as the equation for any asymptote. We need to remember what our transformations are and complete those in order. First, we're looking for any horizontal shifts. Well, that would be this, the negative 4. So we need to go right 4 units. Next, you look for stretches and shrinks. And we don't have any, right? Our, our mother function is 3 to the power of x. We're not multiplying by anything, so no stretch, no shrink. Next, we're looking for reflections. Are we multiplying by a negative anywhere? No, so there's no reflections. 
And lastly, we're looking for those vertical shifts. Are we shifting up or down? That's where that negative one comes in. We're going to go down one unit. So we just have two transformations, right four units and down one unit. So let's take those three points that we graphed and let's transform them. So our very first one, zero, one, we need to go right four units and down a unit. Go to the next point, go right four units and down a unit. And then that value way up here, we can do the same. Okay, before we connect these dots, we want to also shift that asymptote. So our asymptote is a horizontal line, so we need to know if we're going to shift it up or down. And our transformation was to only shift down one unit, so that asymptote will also only shift down one unit. So here is our new asymptote, and we can see that this is y equals negative 1. So let's write that down in our answer block here. For our asymptote, the equation is y equals negative 1. Now we know what we're approaching on this left-hand side. So we can draw the left-hand side of our graph. And then we can connect the dots on the right-hand side. And let's lastly label that. This is p of x. Now we need to identify the domain. Well, we didn't change the domain here. All we did was shift this graph to the right and then down. So our domain stays the same. The possible x values are still all real numbers. The range here, this we changed when we shifted it down, as you can tell because we shifted that asymptote. Now our range goes from a value of negative 1, our asymptote, all the way to positive infinity. Now we're going to talk about another type of exponential function. And that involves the irrational number e. e is defined as this expression, 1 plus 1 over x to the power of x, as x approaches infinity. So as x gets really large, we end up with this number e. And e is approximately equal to 2.718, so on. We write this as a function, f of x equals e to the power of x, and that's how we get the natural exponential function. We want to, in example three, explain how you take that mother function, y equals e to the power of x, and transform it to get this function m of x. So we're really just reviewing those transformations again. So remember, do them in order. First, you're looking for those horizontal shifts. Are we shifting left or right? And no, there's no horizontal shift. Next, you're looking for a stretch or a shrink. Are you multiplying the function by anything? No, there's no stretch or shrink here. Third is looking for a reflection. Are we multiplying by a negative? And we are. See this negative in the front? That tells us that we're reflecting over the x-axis. And then lastly, we're looking for those vertical shifts. Are we shifting up or down? And that's our negative three here at the end. The negative tells us to go down, and we're going down three units. So those are the two transformations you have on the mother function y equals e to the x in order to get this new function m of x. Now let's look at some applications of exponential functions. The most common everyday use of an exponential function are interest rates. And here we talk about simple interest rates and compound interest rates. And you can tell the difference between these equations and which one to use based on the wording of your application problem. So let's look at example four. Bethany needs to borrow $10,000. She can borrow the money at 5.5% simple interest for four years, or she can borrow at 5% with interest compounded continuously for four years. 
Part A asks how much total interest would Bethany pay at 5.5% simple interest? Simple interest tells us we're going to use I equals PRT. Now we just need to determine what are we trying to find and what information are we given? We're asked how much total interest. So we're trying to find I, the interest. And we know the principal from the very beginning of the problem was $10,000. So she's borrowing $10,000. R would be our interest rate as a decimal. So 5.5% is 0 0.055. And T is the time. Well, she's borrowing for four years. Multiply those together and we get $2,200. Now let's compare that to B. In B, we're asked how much total interest would Bethany pay at 5% interest compounded continuously. Well, compounded continuously is our A equals PE to the RT equation. We know we're trying to find A, the total interest. And again, we know the principal P is 10,000. E is that irrational number we just learned about. Our R here is 5%, which as a decimal is 0 0.05 and our time is still four years. Multiply all those together and you get, let's actually simplify that exponent first. We have e to the power of 0 0.2. And you multiply those in your calculator and you get 2214 and three cents. So you can see that when it's compounded continuously, you end up either earning more if it's money you have invested, or you end up having to pay more if you're like Bethany and you borrowed that money. Another example of how we can use exponential equations is with growth. Population tends to grow exponentially. In example five, we see that the population of Canada in 2010 was approximately 34 million with an annual growth rate of 0.804%. At this rate, the population, P of T in millions, can be approximated by this exponential function, P of T, where T is the time in years since 2010. A asks us, is the graph of P an increasing or decreasing exponential function? Remember, this is answered based on the value of your base. Our base is greater than 1, so we have an increasing function. We're going to have a growth function. In part B, we're asked to evaluate P of 5 and interpret its meaning in the context of this problem. Let's set up our equation for P of 5. P of 5 is telling us to take our function and replace our variable t with the value 5. That gives us this equation. Now, this is a crazy base value to raise to the power of 5, so we're going to use our calculator. We have 34 times 1.00804. We're gonna use that caret key to raise that to the power of five. Hit enter and we get 35.39. So our answer is 35.39. Well, what does this mean? That's the interpret its meaning in the context of the problem. Well, P of five is telling us that T equals five. And if you remember from above, T is the time in years since 2010. So T equals five would be five years after 2010. So that would be the year 2015. 
And then our value P of T is the population in millions. So our interpretation would be in 2015, the population of Canada was approximately, do some abbreviations here, 35 million. You have to pay attention to that unit of measurement. It's usually in parentheses. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video helpful and I hope you'll check out some of my other math videos.